it's really important that we begin to change the mindset of young people to know that your vote counts. They don't understand that the legislative arm of government is actually a co-equal arm of government. We have an uh, incredible amount of potential. Whatever it is I was doing because of my personal DNA, it mm -hmm. had to be of an international standard. Which is what, seriously speaking, is all about. Well, hello there. This is Seriously Speaking, and my name remains at this while. Why am I doing this? Because today I have a fellow woman in the house. Sometimes when you see me with a woman, you can't think about today's woman. But the truth is, on this show, we talk about things, fun, politics, whatever it is, but from a serious angle. And today, I have an activist and a politician in the house. Before we recorded this show, we had told you on Twitter that she was going to be here. So you had some questions for her. But she's one of those who, she doesn't know this, I'm surprising her with this, she made me vote the way I voted in 2015. And I'll tell you why. Now you'll know what I voted and where I voted. I'll be back on Seriously Speaking if you don't go away. It's like, careful okay, not I to come, have this I come, I come, I come, OK, you can see we're already chatting. I come back, and my guest is Adiza Bala Usman. It's nice to have you on Seriously Speaking. Thank you for having me, Adiza. So. You couldn't stop us saying, but I do this all the time, because that way you know that this is spontaneous reaction. We are not, we are not planning this interview. I've always wanted to have you sit here. I always wanted you to talk about what it is like to be in politics now after being an activist. But you forget a, a conversation I had with you one morning in Port Harcourt. We're having breakfast, and I'm like, oh my goodness. The person who's running for presidency under the APC, our president currently, um, Muhammadu Buhari, he's a bigot, he's this, he's that. I told you all of those things. By the time we finished our conversation, I walked away completely different because you managed to convince me for different reasons that I will share in my book. For different reasons, but I, 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 you managed to convince me to go that way. So you are responsible. If I'm unhappy today, it's because of you. Well, I'm glad my conversation <laughs> was able to communicate the fact that, you know, the right thing to do was to vote for change. You did say so. Yeah. But before I go there, you know, people refer to you, first of all, as the daughter of a great activist. You are an activist. Yeah. You have your bite that bring back our girls now. Yeah. I would like to begin by what was it about your upbringing that made you as vocal as you have become or have you, as you became over time? Well, I think um, I was brought up in a university environment that... Um, university of Zaria. Yes, ABU mm -hmm. Zaria. I was born and brought up in Zaria. Um, I lived all my life from zero to 24 in Zaria in the university community. So in so doing, um, we, we tend to challenge status quo. My father encouraged dialogue with himself. Encouraged even though you were a girl? Yes, even though it's completely... My, our gender in my family was immaterial because my father considered all of us the same. Um, I have three sisters and three brothers, we're seven of us, and, you know, all of us were treated equally. My dad taught us, the girls, how to change the tires of a car. When you have a poncho, he taught my sisters and I what to do. Mm -hmm. So we're not brought up around gender lines. We're brought up to question um, um, positions. We're brought up to understand that um, you don't just follow things, you understand the ideology behind something. You understand it for yourself. You just mm -hmm. don't go with the bandwagon. You mm -hmm. have to understand issues and discuss issues, and you agree to disagree. Like with my father, we discuss things we don't necessarily agree all the time. Were you odd in the environment that you grew up in? Was that odd? No, actually, it was not. We really? all literally really behaved that. like that. Or just generally, I'm talking generally about being in the north. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, in the north, um, uh, females are not really are expected to, to be seen, not heard. Um, um, being, being a woman, you're, you're not expected to be right there in, in the mix sort of challenging status quo or getting involved in actual like politicking or actual dialogues or actual debates. You're expected to take the back seat. You're expected not to, to sort of um, sit with the, with, with the boys, I will say, or, or sort of be there, mm -hmm. um, being part of any dialogue, being part of any discussion. So indeed, in the North, is is much, much harder for a woman because you, you, you're not expected to, to in any way be part of um, that discussion. Well, seeing you, obviously, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it can be done. You know, whatever the North is, mm -hmm. it can produce women like you. Yeah. It means that there's room there. But would you agree if they say that's probably one of the reasons why the North is still relatively one of the most backward compared mm. to the South mm. in terms of progress, mm. education-wise? Well, yeah, well, education is a challenge. But as I always say, there are thousands of women in the North like me. They just need to be given the opportunity. There are thousands of us that have been educated. There are thousands of us that have the ability, the courage to be able to speak up. It's just being given the right platform. So I always appreciate when um, I'm not any different from so many of us. I've just been opportunity 
tuned to be given an opportunity. And this is why every time I speak, I speak for all of us, mm -hmm. and some of us that have not been able to have that voice. Okay, one would say, can we, can we be right to say your political godfather, mm. godfather yeah. is um, the governor of Kaduna State, Erufai? Well, I, I don't want to call it godfather. He mm -hmm. was my boss. Um, he remains someone that um, I hold very high. Yeah. Um, while I'm in MPA now, I still discuss and dialogue and engage with him mm -hmm. on Kaduna issues, on mm -hmm. national issues. Um, and indeed, um, he has been very supportive in building my confidence. He's one of those people that has the capacity to mentor the young. He believes that the sky is your limit. He doesn't look at uh, gender lines mm -hmm. um, as obviously, you're aware. Obviously, because yeah. when you were made chief of staff, yes. for example, the yes. question was, she's too young, she's female, where did you bring them from? I mean, he's, yes. he's undergone a lot of criticism yes, for some yes. of the women he has appointed. How does he handle that? Yes, with chief of staff, I was the first female chief of staff in the 19 northern states. So there's never been a chief of staff in all the... So it was something that's quite different. And if you're familiar with the job of a chief of staff, he chief of staff interfaces on everything around the governor, literally get the gateway into the, the government house and Absolutely. access to the governor. Absolutely. So it was something the political elite, the political stakeholders... Were you his girlfriend? <clears throat> Absolutely because not. Because I was his girlfriend. Yes, they keep talking. <laughs> oh, it's so ridiculous. Yeah, because I've been... Work, I worked at the BPE from 2000 to date. I'm not as never ever his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but but how, how do how does those things affect your work? Well, I, I I sort of just get on with doing what I have to do. Well, when people see women in in career, and you see your career progression is always tied to some man, always tied to the fact that oh, this person is your girl boyfriend, without looking at the fact of your capacity, your ability. What are you? able to deliver. Mm -hmm. Why are you being trusted to do this? Mm -hmm. So other people that interact with you would now realize that, oh, it's beyond um, her being a girl, beyond all of that. She's actually able to do the job. So mm -hmm. when I started off as chief of staff, there's a lot of resistance. Like, this girl, she's young, she's a woman. How can she come into our... our, our obviously, you did that yeah. job well. Well, I, and yeah. I mean, obviously you did because you got hired, um, you know, in terms of... And from all indications, the past one year that you have headed... MP. There have been a lot of developments, even if I would say so, but there's also been a lot of controversy. Talk about a cabal that wouldn't let the president do his work. Yes, yeah. How would you respond to that? Well, I'm not sure about an existence of any cabal. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't look to, 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 to consider um, anything like cabal. I just think it's a tough job that we all have. We, we inherited this governance structure that has been, I would say, not performing optimally for years. But is it possible for a cabal to be able to affect the president in a way that he can't function properly? Well, first of, of all, I don't recognize a cabal, mm -hmm. but to the extent that there are people that would influence the president, I do not think so. Mm -hmm. I think we should be mindful of the fact that this is, a, we, we inherited this complete mess. So it takes a lot of effort, commitment, and drive the process and indeed when you look at the totality of governance what percentage of those people are new we look at the whole chain of civil servants the whole chain of civil servants are civil servants that have been progressing by virtue of In a, a political way. party mm -hmm. that is not ours by virtue of a partic particular type of thinking so these people were nurtured on inefficiency so how many of us are in, in governance? Um, what one, like for example, myself and my three executive directors, compared to 3,900 staff of the MPA. So four of us are going to drive a change around 3,900 people that have been performing at below optimal for the past 16 years. Well, there's some, still some perception issues. Yeah. Say for yeah. example, the fact that people believe our president has been very soft mm. on the, on the, on the by, uh, Katureras, the yeah. issue of, you know, as against the boys who are agitating for IPOB. The fact that our president is still seen as a bigot mm. because his, his appointees are more from the Northeast or Northwest. Well, I think we need to look at the numbers clearly to know if there are any sort of skewed perception mm -hmm. of appointment. Let's not speak randomly. Let's be very specific because you see people from the Southeast, people from the um, South, South occupying very crucial positions in government. And as I also say, we should, you know, this divisive narrative that has been built in our psyche. You know, people spent money to make us divisive in our perspective. And I think as Nigerians, we need to move away from that and realize it's not about where you come from, but it's about the value you're going to add to um, in, in any circumstance you find ourselves. When you look at the cattle rearing issue, the cattle rearing has been so much addressed that the, um, um, the, the they are now moving to kidnapping people. So a lot of the people that are kidnapped around the Kaduna axis and all of that, the, the, the Fulani headsmen are saying, you have stopped us from um, cattle. Okay. Yeah, so now we're kidnapping you people because we used to be stealing all the cattle and selling them <laughs> in the south. Uh -huh. So there has been um, tremendous effort in that. 
So we cannot say the president is soft peddling on any um, sort of position vis-a-vis. -vis. So when you have a, a platform that is challenging the sovereignty of the country, that is, that is something that I think is non-negotiable. Nobody should question or challenge our sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So for any action that is taken is to preserve the unity of Nigeria. And our unity is, 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 is core to who we are. Okay. Well, I can't stop without talking about the Bring Back Our Girls. We're very active with it. Yeah. Now you're in this govern, yes. government that people feel is not doing enough. Yes. In fact, people say mm -hmm. that the whole idea of Bring Back Our Girls was to kick out the past government. Yeah. You know, and now this one is there. Suddenly all the girls are coming out one by one. So it was all... Well, you know, um, that narrative is such a laughable narrative because the last government, you know, when you have any form of kidnap, the first few days are critical to rescuing anyone and the government did nothing. The government itself confirmed that it did not do any rescue effort within the first 14 days of the rescue of the girl. So it's taking this government just as long to find them? No, no, but, but you see, with rescue, with an abduction, kidnap, those first few days are critical. So when you have someone inheriting a kidnap that has been, what, a year from when they took office, mm -hmm. so whatever they do is sort of a catch-up. And to the extent that you have caught up so much that you've had a hundred X number of girls that have been rescued and released mm -hmm. under... So you have to acknowledge that. Never mind the fact that there are still girls that remain in captivity, and you know the Chibok girls... girls are actually in captivity. Yes, Chibok girls are a symbol of everyone that has been held captive by Boko Haram. They're not the only people that were kidnapped, but they're symbolic because they're in a school. They're young girls. So they, they represent a, a, a light. They represent this um, beacon that draws people's attention to the, 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 the whole challenge, the whole insurgency, the fact that people have been held captive. So for me, every person that has been rescued, we celebrate every person outside of the Chibok girls and we retain our advocacy. I'm now in Lagos. Mm -hmm. I'm not in Abuja. To go to you still wear your badge? I still wear my badge everywhere I go. I also go to Falomo on weekends um, mm -hmm. to sort to to, to to sustain the advocacy. But will like, they ever be found? Will they ever be found? You well, think? you know, even um, naturally, it would be difficult to have 200 people that are all 200 and uh, all alive over a period of three years. Some would have died of natural causes, and some. Um, would not be found. Mm -hmm. But indeed, staying the course on the Chibok girls is to remind the world that people are still held captive, to remind the world that there is insurgency in the Northeast, mm -hmm. to, to remain focused on that. I would like you to end by what's the narrative that you think we should be given now as Nigerians? Um, I think we should um, focus on instituting our reforms, understand that um, the journey is a long journey. We've started, we're going ahead. Whatever it is that we are seen not to have done within the shortest period, appreciate what was inherited, appreciate that they're just, when you look at the percentage, as I say, what percentage of people are new in governance? Mm -hmm. The whole civil service structure is not new. So let's change the narrative and be hopeful. Hopeful, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being on the show. Yes. And I must go now, but I would like to go with the quote that you gave me that's, getting the job is one thing and doing the job is another. Yeah. So you're doing the job. Yes. You keep on doing the job. I'm doing my very best. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. I Thank you for watching. I'll see you again on Seriously Speaking.